I'd rather like live the way I want to live, stand for what I believe in, than like live in a fear that uh, something could happen. Well, I'd rather be a free man in my grave. Uh, um, so, of course, yeah. And by the way, I have the massive advantage of having grown children. So when you have little kids at home, and I, I, I haven't had a very adventurous or dangerous life, but a couple times, one time in particular, I was pretty sure I was going to die. And I had little kids at home. And um, I was in a plane crash, and I remember as it was going down, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, they're not going to thrive if I die. I mean, that really terrified me. And But now that they're grown, it's like, I am going to die. Yeah. So this we know, and I meditate on that a lot. I don't think it's morbid. I think it's liberating. And to me, realize, like, what what are you going to do to me? You know, there's, I'm not afraid at all. Yeah. Um, and I mean that. You may have come to the obvious conclusion that the real debate is not between Republican and Democrat or socialist and capitalist, right, left. The real battle is between people who are lying on purpose and people who are trying to tell you the truth. It's between good and evil. It's between honesty and falsehood. And we hope we are on the former side. That's why we created this network, the Tucker Carlson Network. And we invite you to subscribe to it. Go to tuckercarlson.com slash podcast. Our entire archive is there. A lot of behind the scenes footage of what actually happens in this barn uh, when only an iPhone is running. TuckerCarlson.com slash podcast. You will not regret it. Why do the bad people have so much power? Because the bad people have all the money. Where'd they get all the money? You gave it to them by using their businesses, businesses that undermine this country and empower countries that don't seek the best for your family. Trust us. But there is an alternative, it's called Public Square. Public Square is a network of over 75,000 independent businesses, small businesses in this country, from which you can buy guns and ammo, fresh food, household goods, things you need to live. And when you buy them, you can feel certain that you are not doing a bad deed, you're doing a good deed. It will make this a better and more independent country and make your kids' future brighter. Publicsquare.com. We are honored, we are proud to have them as a sponsor of this show. So, I, I, the people who got the vaccine don't want to talk about it because they feel shame. I get it. The people who went along with it because they really believed it and now are starting to realize, oh gosh, I was misled, but I can't admit that because it makes me look like an asshole, weak, like a follower. Um, I understand that too. The people who called for the death of the unvaccinated, that's a kind of the category that's harder for me. To, people like Jimmy Kimmel, for example, who famously said- Sean and, Penn as well. And Sean Penn as well, yeah. who I know actually and sort of like, but what, what, I like him less after hearing that. What, how do you treat people like that who wanted you to die? Dr. Fauci said that if hospitals get any more overcrowded, they're gonna have to make some very tough choices about who gets an ICU bed. And that choice doesn't seem so tough to me. Vaccinated person having a heart attack? Yes, come right on in, we'll take care of you. Unvaccinated guy who gobbled horse goo? Rest in peace, Wheezy. You're I think you framed that in the right in, in the right place. Like there's, um, uh, you know, there's a great mashup that Rogan talked about a few times where it was all these different shows and it said, brought to you by Pfizer. Yeah. Anderson Cooper brought to you by yeah. Pfizer. It's an amazing. I think you have to realize that there's, it's all about the money. And and as you get into this, you read Bobby's book about the real Anthony Fauci. You realize, if you want to know what's really going on, not just in big pharma, but in government, yeah. is follow the money. And the, and even in the NFL, I mean, there was a strong push. They sent stooges out to every team to try and enforce a vaccination level above ninety percent on every team, with zero exemption, with zero. Um, uh, informed consent, uh, just get this so that we look good because big pharma ad spend is humongous, not just on the late night shows, it's obviously influences Hollywood, the NFL, so you have to understand who is actually playing but I, got, I was talking to a Navy SEAL friend of mine the other day who just got out of, out of the Navy, and like professional athletes, I mean, these are the last people who needed the vax, and so there was this intense push to make them all get the vax. He left the Navy over it, but... He said most of his friends on the SEAL team he was on did not get the vax, got fake vax cards because they knew they're very in touch with their physical health. They're SEALs, yeah. they're not so different from an NFL player. Mm -hmm. How many NFL players actually got the vax? 
you have any idea? I don't have any idea. I know that I'm, I'm sure that there was uh, plenty who got fake cards. I feel like, you know, there's, uh, I think there's a base level of uh, hesitancy around just the uh, uh, big pharma medicine in general when, well, yeah. when you're black. Well, I was about to say, it's like 70% on, black. But yeah. To their great credit, a lot of black guys are like, no way. Yeah, and based on the history, I think it's warranted. <laughs> totally we know fair. any of the history about it's some totally of the, fair. the uh, human experiments that went on and ridiculous things in some of those communities. If you know about the, you know, what's gone on in foreign countries as well with some of these vaccines, uh, predominantly uh, places like Africa. Oh, yeah. Um, where people have been maimed and killed and paralyzed by these vaccines, many of which are not actually approved anymore uh, in the States, get sent over to Africa. Again, that's a reference to something that Bobby talked about in his book about Fauci. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting chapters around that. So on a base level, there was a lot of hesitancy, like, oh, I don't think this is how we do this. <laughs> but in the NFL, it was like, if you're working for a team, there was no choice. It was, it was get backs. If you're a player, there was a choice. But if you chose not to get it, and you had a whole different set of rules, you had to wear a different colored armband, you had to, you couldn't uh, go to a restaurant, you couldn't uh, spend time at somebody's house and more than three people were there, uh, you couldn't go anywhere on the road, you, uh, you know, had to test every single morning and, and not enter the building until you got a negative back. Uh, that all went away once the uh, once the playoffs happened, because of course they weren't ruin the money at that point. And all the testing went away, but uh, oh, there was a playoff exemption for the disease. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just I gotta ask if they're making you wear a colored piece of clothing. Yeah. Okay. Since all of us grew up in the United States, where World War II is the kind of only historical event we learn about, forcing a small despised minority to identify itself with a yellow piece of clothing it seems kind of resonant. Did anyone in the NFL say maybe not a good idea to? to force people to wear yellow armbands if they weren't vaxxed? I don't think they cared. I don't think they cared. I think they just wanted to hit, hit their numbers. So we, we look like Nazis, but we don't care. Yeah, I mean, I, I when the Stooge came and talked to us, I asked a lot of questions about like uh, informed consent, about testing, about uh, um, liability, and he basically answered my questions. The, the president of the team ended the meeting uh, and I'd say a ton of people from every level of the building came up afterwards and thanked me for asking the questions because many of them had no, no, no choice. Just get vaxxed or lose your job. And there are certain coaches around the league who quit because they didn't want to get vaxxed. I'm sure there may have been uh, you know, fake cards that, uh, that went around. I hope so. Um, and there were, you know, we also know there was many batches that were super toxic and deadly and many batches that were perhaps saline and uh, you know, they didn't, uh, didn't cause any adverse uh, but the interesting thing about around vaccines. Can I ask you a question? So do you think that the drug makers knew that they were giving out saline vaccines? Oh, I, don't, I mean, that's a pure conjecture. I think there's, I have read things about um, the amount of, uh, amount of vaccines that went out and it wouldn't have been possible to uh, produce that uh, to that level. So there may have been some knowledge um, around that. But again, that's just conjecture and I, I don't have any specific evidence yeah. on that. I'm not an expert at that, but I am an expert at my body and what goes in it and, yes. and uh, how I feel about, about that. But um, yeah, you know, uh, the whole thing has been uh, a real uh, interesting thought experiment uh, in action around like what people are willing to put up with, how you can control through fear, uh, and how obedient someone will be. Because uh, remember what was going on on all the networks, you had the live death tolls that were ticking up as you watched the TV. You had the live case numbers. You had um, just a fear moment. And then anybody that stood up to it was canceled. I mean, all the Twitter files that got released when Elon took over that show the collusion between the alphabet uh, companies uh, that, that uh, you know, control a lot of stuff. And the old, you know, people with X, what was going on at Facebook and the censorship. And all these true experts in it. You know, the Robert Holmes, the Peter McCullough, the yeah. Jack Corys, all these different people who stood up, the Alec parents, and who, who, you know, said, tried to, tried to just get the message out, were silenced and censored. I think a, a, a person with any level of common sense would, even if they got the vaccine, would go, that's kind of weird. Why are we silencing all this in your opinions? When in the history of the world have the, have sen has the censorship ever been, uh, been, been done by the good guys? 
you know, the good guys are the ones doing the censorship. That actually doesn't happen. What are you scared of? You're <laughs> no, scared of people being able to make up their own mind? Yeah. And, you know, you, you see it on, I mean, Bobby just released a video, 30 minute video uh, about, about who he is that got censored by Facebook, which is just wild. I mean, they're censoring the election stuff, which we know is going on, which we, we, you know, the um, Cambridge Analytica, if you've watched that documentary about what happened, um, it is just pretty wild that the, the world that we live in where there's a, uh, you know, for the idea of even free speech and what is it is called into a question all the time. I just read um, an interesting book that was written a few years ago called The Coddling of the American Mind, um, and it basically talking about what's going on at college campuses, which we're seeing now, all this, you know, this uh, outrage and different things. It started post-2016 when Trump got elected, when campuses felt like they needed to create safe spaces because speech is violent. You know, certain types of rhetoric is actually violent. So we're uh, vilifying the uh, opinions now, and we're canceling people based on what they believe. And, and that's a slippery slope to go down, whether you cancel somebody who's, um, you know, super racist or, 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 or uh, you know, against the opinion that you believe in, like none of that actually works. Ignoring the shit you don't want to listen to or, or be a part of is one thing, but like picking and choosing what to censor is a very slippery slope. And you being in the media, you know how important it is to, to get people on all different sides. Well, you can't have democracy if people can't see what they think. But but democracy in general, I mean, this country is founded as a constitutional republic, yeah. which empowers the civil liberties. You know, democracy well, you can't is have always government unless yeah. people are not slaves, unless they're free. But like, you know, so, I mean, democracy always falls into into fascism and, yes. and tyranny and ultimately dictatorship. Unfortunately, I'm aware of that. <laughs> that, that and that's where we're at now. Why do you, oh, I'm aware. Why do you think that is? Why do you think, demo, in a lot of 19th century sort of free-minded people in Europe looked over at what was happening in the newly in the United States and said that's going to become a dictatorship ultimately. Why do you think that happens? I think I think uh, there's a lot of reasons. I think uh, entitlement is, is a big part of our society that has, has been, uh, you know, a, a cancer for us because people believe that their opinion is more important than somebody else's opinion. Um, you know, it was built, it was, uh, it was weaponized against uh, People who chose not to get the vaccine, people would say, your freedom isn't more important than my fucking right to live. And, 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 uh, but I, I think that, um, I think ultimately, uh, it creates, um, it creates too many voices that, uh, that are all about division. So there's, you know, a, a true democracy where every vote matters means that. All of us are important to the whole, but when democracy spirals out of control and entitlement uh, is, is the common thread through it, then nobody believes that your opinion matters as much as their opinion. And it goes into uh, a straight egotistical, um, narcissistic view, which ultimately leads to some sort of fascism, some sort of uh, tyrannical stuff. And, and when it's weaponized by the people in control who control the messaging, and the media control the food supply, control the water supply. You're you're fighting a losing battle. It does feel that way, and it, it feels like you know both of us grew up in a country that was outwardly focused on it. Its enemies were outside its borders, right? I mean, I grew up during the Cold War. I mean, it was the Soviet Union. They were China. You know, pick a country when you're at odds with. It does seem like all the energy. Um, that the federal government musters against its enemies is being mustered against American citizens. Like, we're the enemy. That's the way it feels to me. Yeah, I was I was at the Kentucky Derby this last weekend, and they were swearing in some new uh, recruits to, uh, I think, join the Army. And so uh, they had them repeat uh, repeat after the, you know, sergeant or whatever who was swearing them in. And I just was stuck with that one line that uh, protect uh, against uh, all enemies, foreign and domestic. Yes. I was like, and I said kind of domestic out loud because I was like, are we forgetting that one? Because there's a lot of domestic people in this country who actually don't love America, who actually don't um, don't want to see us thrive. I'm super patriotic. I think it's because my grandpa fought in the Second World War, was a prisoner of war, and believed in freedom and fought for it and lost 
many friends in the Air Force who were at uh, Pearl Harbor and, you know, and flew many bombing, uh, bombing missions over, um, you know, to try and liberate um, the French and Polish people there uh, over in Europe and, and uh, almost lost his life for it and lost a lot of friends and believed in this country and, and the freedoms uh, that he was willing to fight and die for. And so that's what I grew up in, you know, and I love this country and I want to see it thrive. And I think there's a lot of people that don't give a shit about it. And if you look at some of the policies, how does it make any sense to have, you know, open borders, to have non-secure elections, to have, um, you know, the lobbying that we have in Washington where, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, the big ag, the big everything uh, controls the policy of the policymakers. You have people in Congress and, and the Senate who, uh, you know, who, go right from, you know, their, their duties to these huge, you know, huge profitable jobs or speaking engagements and pick a, pick a, you know, a, a swath of the economy, whether it's banking or ag or military defense or whatever it is, and, and everybody's in everybody's pocket. And then you create these bills that have 40 different things in it. We're spending billions of dollars to Ukraine and billions of dollars to Israel and billions of dollars to these college campuses. Um, there's just a lot of issues right now that, that uh, seem really un-American, and I think there's a lot of red-blooded Americans. People are like, how can you know, how can Trump have such support? Well, people are fed up with that, and he speaks the rhetoric of like taking back, you know, making America great yes. again and stuff. My thing is, he had four years to do it and didn't drain the swamp. And whether he just got scared because of what he learned when he was in there, I think is very plausible. Um, but that's why I was interested when Bobby came to me and said, "Would you think about being my running mate?" And I said, are you serious? <laughs> I said, I'm a fucking football player. <laughs> but I love this country, and, and I'd love to be a part of, uh, you know, bringing it back to what she used to be. There's a great... Uh, Did you think about it? Oh, yeah, I thought about it. I definitely thought about it. Because I love Bobby, and, and I just wanted to hear what he had to say about it. There's a great uh, opening scene of one of my favorite shows called Newsroom. Did you ever see the opening scene with Jeff no. Daniels? Jeff Daniels is a, he's an anchor uh, for a news station. And there's, and, there's, and there's a panel, yeah, great person. <laughs> and he gets asked this question, uh, you know, why is America so star spangled great? You know, what makes America so great? Somebody says like uh, democracy, and somebody says like freedom. And he's like, uh, you know, he doesn't want to answer the question. He says, you know, the, the preamble of the Constitution is the greatest piece of you know written material ever, something like that. And then he goes, no, I'm not gonna let you off like that. You, know, you got to give me an answer. And he goes into this like three minute uh, monologue about how America is not the greatest country anymore. He talked about the literacy rates and math rates and reading rates and uh, you know uh, uh, we spend more than the next 25 on the you know on, on uh, defense spending and uh, but at the end he said but we America's not the greatest country anymore but it could be and he talks about what it used to be and he used to dream big dreams and and uh, build incredible you know uh, buildings and great technology and different things it's like super patriotic like and that starts the whole show out where he gets kind of canceled for this or. He gets put on display like, oh my God, like this guy is willing to like ta tackle some of the big, the big issues in this country and, and like keep it real. And I think that's what I, that, that that resonated with me because I'm like, yes, like what used to make America great, like how can we get back to that? And that's why I love people who are willing to stand up for what they believe in, like yourself. And and the stuff you would talk about uh, on your show was was uh, yeah, but that's my people, job. No, no, not, but nobody else is doing that though. You know, they're, yeah, but they're cowards. They're, they're cowards. They're cowards. They're cowards. They're cowards. Well, yeah, I get it. But we're a country of cowards now. People are not willing to stand up for or stand up to the people that are in charge. Well, There's I know not many of you. And I have such contempt for them. I mean, they're not even good at fascism. That's, that's I guess, my final analysis. They're not even what, good at this. What was it for you? Were you just like, fuck it. Like, I'm going to say what I want to say. And, and were you always like that? Or was there something yeah, that I've broke? Been that way. Well, there had to be something where you like, okay. Because you talked about JFK. You know, and, and, the, and the CIA being well, a part I of his death. Well, I did We were talking about this last night at dinner, which is so interesting. I mean, you're a professional athlete. This is not your day job. No. It is my day job. No. I've lived in Washington for 35 years, and I didn't really quite... I mean, I had lots of opinions, all kinds of opinions, but they were sort of aligned with a political party, and I didn't ever question any of the basic um, assumptions that I had, you know, say, oh, Roosevelt knew that the Japanese were going to attack Oahu in December yeah. of 1941. I was like, you must be crazy. Well, it turns out that's true. Yeah. There was a Senate inquiry into it during the war that suggested that strongly because it's real. 
that and a lot of other things. But it took me a long time to even ask those questions. And when I did, I was, I was well, then I had to leave the city. I, I moved out because I was so shocked by it and so distressed by it. But you were saying that, I mean, the real question is not how did I come to that? I mean, I was marinating in that world my whole life. Um, why did it take me so long? That's the real question. But how did you, or on an athletic track, how did you come to these conclusions? That's the more unusual. Well, I think I was, I was, it was a, a number of things. Um, I always wanted to question what I believed because I felt like it could strengthen that. Yes. And although that wasn't maybe the, the thought uh, uh, process growing up in the church, there was, there was a lot to like just believe this and have faith. Don't ever yes. question it. If you question it, that's doubt and doubt is a sin. But I was like, I don't know. I, I kind of want to question this so so I can have it uh, confirmed. Can, can I just point out that on the cross, as he was being tortured to, to death, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right. Jesus said that. So the idea... Yeah, the idea it's a doubt. Way, it's a doubt, yeah. Absolutely. On the cross. Yeah. Um, but but I got into... So uh, I think you're allowed to ask questions. And have well, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of gave myself that permission when I was going <laughs> to... But I did a, a report my sophomore year in high school on JFK, and I was just kind of super fascinated by his charisma and uh, the Kennedy family in general. Yes. And then his death, and uh, what little I knew about it, um, and I talked to um, some people that maybe didn't believe the Warren Commission or the official narrative, so I did a report on it. It was more on JFK, because I think we had to pick an influential person from history to report on, so I picked JFK. And in high school. In high school. And back then, with very limited internet access, I did a lot of research uh, in the library and read a lot of things, read the Warren Commission, a um, decent amount of it, the Warren Report, and was like, there's some bullshit in here. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. You tell me this magic bullet from this guy went boom, 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 through him, and then they just happened to find it, you know, at the hospital, a certain spot. I was like, that doesn't sound right. So that kind of got me into. Uh, questioning things, conspiracies, for sure, questioning things. I've seen some really interesting UAP phenomenons in the sky. I've talked about it, and I know that's something that you, you are fascinated by. Um, I, you know, at the time, I also uh, found a, a, a way to, to see uh, the Zapruder film, which uh, you know, was very uh, fascinating as well, uh, even though it's super grainy. Um, and that kind of got me into questioning things. And then there's been a lot of really interesting uh, things that have happened over the years. My grandfather, though, he, you know, I didn't get to know him that well, but I do know that he always questioned uh, and believed that, uh, that Roosevelt knew um, about the Japanese coming. And that always stuck with him because he, uh, you know, he was super patriotic. And another one of my heroes, Pat Tillman, who left the NFL, to join uh, 